You know, I believe that today the glory of God is not just reserved uh, for the people overseas. I'm going to say that again. I believe today that the glory of God, come on, that the power of God, come on, that the moving of the Spirit, come on, signs, wonders, and miracle is not just for overseas. It's not for just the people that have never heard it. It's for us. It's for us in this church. Let me share this testimony that came in. It says, I wanted to share a testimony from a couple of, for a couple of months. I was having a fever every night along with other horrific symptoms that I won't even mention. These symptoms were so bad that they sent this person uh, to the emergency room at one point. It says, every morning and throughout the day, I would have lines appear throughout my body. Many times the symptoms would worsen after the lines appeared. I had been declaring God's word over myself, but really having a hard time praying due to how frail my body felt. One morning after having been in pain and experienced some fever all night long, I woke up and for a second, I thought to check my body for the lines that usually followed. However, immediately I declared that the devil is a liar and that I had no need to check myself. In that moment, my body felt very broken but I decided to just ignore every symptom. Throughout the day, I refused to look at my skin, no matter how I felt. Listen, there was no grand prayer. There was no tangible touch from God. But from that small decision that I made that morning, I began to feel better. And by the next day, I was symptom-free and have been free of all symptoms since then. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, this is what faith does. Come on. Faith doesn't look at the problem. You got to remember Abraham. He said he didn't look at his body. Come on, he didn't look at the natural thing. He didn't look at the frailty of his body, at the oldness of his body. He didn't look at the barrenness of Sarah's womb. Come on, this is what faith does. Faith has to see the impossible. Faith has to not consider what our eyes might see, but consider what our eyes of faith know. That Jesus is the answer that He said He would heal us. That healing is still for today. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I love stories like that. Because it's, it's, it's a believer today just taking the simple truth of God. When you know our natural self would be look at it a lot, look at it a lot, and, and even look at it and speak to it. Listen, Smith Wigglesworth said one time, you cannot pray the prayer of faith looking at your problem. You got to look at God when you pray the prayer of faith. You got to look at something other than what your natural eye is seeing or your or your bank account is saying. Come on, praise the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah, praise God. Well, we're going to have a great time in the Lord this morning. Amen. How many of you are expecting something? Yes. Praise God, I'm expecting something. Oh, wait, yes. Praise the Lord. You know, in this church we're contending for revival. Amen. Contending. That's a strong word. It's not a weak word. It's a strong word. We're contending. That means we got to fight on it. Come on. I've got to fight on for revival. Amen. We're contending for revival individually. We're contending for revival corporately. You know, in revival, we get to experience God's glory. Really, all revival stuff is based in the glory of God. And did you know that we were created for God's glory? We were created for God's glory. Actually, man was created in the glory of God. He was clothed with glory. Glory was all about him, around him, in him, upon him, uh, encircling him all in life until he fell. But praise the Lord, we've been redeemed. Come on, we've got the glory back. Come on, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Praise God, we are the glorious church. Did you know that God is serious about his church? He is serious about His church. Amen. Really, the church is God's heartbeat. It's what God's heart beats for. It beats to get another child into Amen. the kingdom, into the family. But then He also, His heart beats for us that are in. Come on. That's why it doesn't say just convert them and leave them alone. It says convert them and then we be discipled. Come on, that we be trained up, that we be raised up. God is serious about his church. Amen. Praise the Lord. And uh, I'm reminded of a story that George Pearson, y'all know George Pearson? That's a brother Copeland's uh, son-in-law. He told a story, you know, he had been doing church for a long time. How many of you have been doing church for a long time? <laughs> Praise the Lord. 
I'm, uh, hey, it's good to be, have been doing church for a long time. Praise the Lord. It's good to have been in for a long time. I'm glad you're here today to say that. Uh, but he recognized that, uh, you know, church had kind of, it had kind of picked up some stuff along the way. Maybe some not so good stuff. He found himself not even wanting to come in during praise and worship. He would sit outside because he, he wasn't happy with the praise and worship team. His wife would sit in the back of the church while he preached. I mean, they had some stuff going on. They, but they had nailed it down to a good science. I mean, they knew what they were supposed to do. They came in. They had a routine. They had a clock in the back. They knew what was happening. They followed along that line. But he was out of the country one time, and he was praying, and the Lord said this to them. He said, I want my church back. God is serious about His church. He said, I want signs, wonders, and miracles reintroduced into my church. Amen. You know, I don't want to be in the category where the Lord has to say to me, I want my church back. Amen. Me, the church, individually, or us, the church, corporately, I don't want God to have to say that to me. But I'm glad at least He called something out. And there's a testimony of this because it, it tells us something. It tells us that the church, even though it's good church, even though it's big church, can be lost along the way. God is interested in His church. He said, I don't want healing hidden back behind the platform and away from the congregation. He said, I don't want them signs, wonders, and miracles just once in a while, uh, once a year at a conference or on special occasions. He said, I want signs, wonders, and miracles to become as much a regular part of the life of your church as it was in the book of Acts. Come on, we have said it. We will keep saying it. The book of Acts is our pattern. We cannot move off of it. We cannot sell short of it. We have got to pursue it. We have got to believe it's for us. But the truth is we are the church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so he began to talk to him. He said, I want my healing and miracle ministry back in my church. Well, you know, Pastor George, he, he pastors a church in Texas. He wasn't writing this just about overseas. He was writing about a church in America, a big church, a good church. But the Lord was saying he wanted his church back. He said, I also want the full operation of the gifts of the Spirit back in my church. They've been edged out and I want them back. Demonstrations of the supernatural are one of the major distinguishing marks of my glorious church. And it should be a common occurrence. Praise the Lord. Come on, this is what we're contending for. We're contending for all that God has. We're contending for revival, to live in the fullness of God's life. And we're not just contending for revival that blows, come on, blows in, stays for a while and then blows out. Come on, we're contending for daily revival. Revival means to revive again to life. We ought to be the church living in the fullness of God's life daily, individually, daily, corporately, together. We need revival. Amen. God intends for us to live in a revival. It builds the church. It strengthens the church. We need it consistently. Amen. So several years back, uh, the Lord began talking to me a lot about revival you know, the Lord will go through seasons where He'll get on a subject or a topic with me. And uh, sometimes, I would be, uh, sometimes I would be here in church. Sometimes I would be at home. Sometimes one time I remember I was in Zimbabwe, Africa, uh, you know, doing something. And just out of the clear, the Lord would start talking to me again about revival. And He began, first of all, to talk to me about what He, he calls revival. You know, sometimes we're, we're in the midst of something that's really God and we're not even sensitive enough to know it. You know, sometimes we pigeonhole revival into one single little thing that we know. Yeah. One single little thing that we think. But really, revival is much bigger than that. And if we would open up our eyes to what the Lord sees as revival and be thankful for what we have and rejoice in that and embrace that and live in the fullness of that. Come on, sometimes the glory of God means you're dancing. Come on, you're laughing. You're rolling all over the floor. I mean, if there are chandeliers, we'd be swinging from them. Praise God. But sometimes in the glory of God, you're just sitting quietly in His presence. Hallelujah. But he began telling me about what is revival. And then he made a statement to me. I remember the first time he said it. I was sitting in my chair here at church. And he said there are conditions conducive to revival. Conducive means uh, conditions that set the stage for something, that make something more likely to happen. And in that moment when the Lord said that to me, he instantly gave me four things. 
He gave me four conditions, four principles, we could say. But I thought that was it. Praise the Lord. I was happy about that. But as time went on and various just, I'd be in places and the Lord would say, here's another condition conducive to revival. Why? Because the Lord wants us to have revival and he wants us to know revival is our, it's, it's partly us. It's our partnering with God. God doesn't just sovereignly in heaven decide he's going to give a revival and sovereignly send it to a group of people. No, it's a partnership with God. Who's contending for revival? Who's hungry for revival? Who's making room for revival? And so over the course of several years, the Lord gave me uh, 12 conditions that are conducive to revival. Amen. I'm going to run through those very quickly this morning for a certain reason. And uh, I want you, as I do, to mark a few of these and look at a few of these because they're going to be important as to what I'm going to preach on this morning so that you understand some things. One thing is hunger and desire. Second thing is prayer. The third is an expectation or faith. Mark that down. Come on, if we want to have revival, we're going to have to be living in faith. We're going to have to use our faith. Number four, a love for God, a love for people, compassion and sincerity. Number five, unity and consecration. Mark that down, consecration. Come on, being set apart for the Lord and His kingdom. Number six, an understanding of the goodness of God. Praise the Lord. Number seven, the fear of the Lord. That includes repentance. It includes humility. It includes holiness. It means to fear the Lord is to hate evil. Did you know that there are over 300 scriptures about the fear of the Lord? Hallelujah. God is serious about the church. Number eight, kingdom-minded purposes. This would include a purpose in going after the lost. It would also include a purpose in a pursuit of discipleship. Number nine, boldness. Number 10, honor of the word. Number 11, embracing all of the expressions of the Holy Spirit. Come on, making room for Him to move. Running when He wants you to run. Shouting when He wants you to shout. Amen. Praise the Lord. Number 12, and the flow of the kingdom being righteousness, peace, and joy. These three things, righteousness, peace, and joy, we could preach endless about those three things. But that is the flow of heaven. It's the culture of heaven. And so when your life is kept in a place of righteous standing with God, when your life is kept in a place of the peace of God, come on, when you're entertaining and living in the joy of the Lord, you're going to make room for what God wants to do and how God wants to move in your life. I believe that we are to be contending for these conditions in our life individually, in the church corporately. I believe that we are to be uh, pressing into these principles. And now this morning I'm going to talk to you about being the remnant church and a remnant people. Because I believe that it's the remnant church and a remnant people that will contend for revival and see revival, that will see the hand of the Lord, that will see the move of the Holy Spirit in such a way. Sometime back, the Lord talked to me. I I shared this with you toward the beginning of last year. Uh, The Lord talked to me about the church. And He said that there's a disparity between the nominal... He called it the nominal church and the remnant church. Uh... The nominal church meaning uh, the shallow, that, that stay along the shallow shores. That maybe don't full, preach the full gospel. Uh, versus of the deep church, those that are willing to go out into the deep things of the Lord, out into the spiritual things of the Lord. It has to do with illumination, this disparity. It has to do with depth. It has to do with the degree of light. Praise the Lord. And the Lord told me that uh, the disparity between the nominal church and the remnant church was going to continue to widen. I know this is not what we want to hear, but I'm just telling you how the Lord said it to me. And He began to remind me that we need to purpose ourselves as a church and as a people uh, to be a remnant church, to be a remnant people sticking to the Lord tightly. Sticking with the Word, not compromising. Come on, staying with the Holy Spirit. Doing things in God's will. Doing things in God's way. With uh, no pulling back. uh, No reserve. You know, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, that there is a great falling away that's going to come. 
The Bible actually says this, that before the return of the Lord, there is a great falling away. Do you know that to fall away from something means you have to be attached to something? Uh, it's referring to the church. It's referring to people waxing cold. It's referring to people moving away. You know, I, I hate to say this, but I, I have to say it. Over my course of being with the Lord for some years, I've watched people pull away from the Lord. I've watched, I've watched ministers who had a call of God and stood in an office at one time that now aren't even really serving the Lord. They're, I'm not talking about salvation here. Okay? I'm just talking about being in the nominal church and the remnant church. Because when you live in the shallow place, uh, there, there does come the ability at times for things to cause in life to move you away from the Lord. We don't want to be found in that category. Amen. I've watched people, anointed people that I thought would never, never ever diminish in any way with the Lord, get completely out. It happens. And so we have, to, we have to be aware. We have to be on guard. You know, one thing I learned a long time ago when I went through a Christian counseling course is that the first time that you think you're not susceptible to something is a sign of pride, and that means that you've just opened yourself up. Anytime that you think you're not capable of sin, sin is lying at your door. Anytime that you think, I love the Lord so much and there's absolutely no way that I would turn from Him, there's just things waiting. There's just things nipping at your heel to try to get you. Because usually what happens with a Christian is they don't wake up one day loving the Lord and then the next day they don't really love the Lord and want to do their own thing. It's a gradual thing. It's gradual the way that people fall away. The truth is, is that not everyone stays, not everyone endures until the end. The Bible says that those who endure to the end, man, we're going to get a reward. There's all kind of good stuff coming. I mean, life can be good now, but oh, the glories of heaven and the glories of the Lord coming with a reward. Praise God. We're going to be rewarded for remaining. We're going to be rewarded for enduring. We're going to be rewarded for remaining faithful and staying to the end no matter what. That is the remnant church. Church. The church that will remain. We saw it on the day of Pentecost. The wind blew. The fire came. The Holy Spirit was poured out. But what was standing in that upper room was the remnant. It was not the 500 people that started out all loving God and fiery and heard the words of Jesus to go and wait until they were in due with power from on high. Some got weary. Some got tired. Some let life's responsibilities and things that they needed to do drag them out, pull them out, turn them, turn their attention away from what was in that upper room that God had planned for them, that God had ordained for them. Amen. It was that moment that birthed the New Testament church. The New Testament church was birthed out of a remnant. Not all those that had loved Jesus. Not all those that had walked with Jesus. Many times they departed. We see it in John chapter 10. All the people followed him and followed him. And the first time he began to preach and teach something that was a little difficult, something they didn't understand, something they didn't like, the Bible says they departed. And listen, I want to tell you that Jesus, he didn't turn around and run after them. He just turned around to those that were still there and said, are you going to go too? I feel like that's what he's asking the church today. Who's going to remain? Who's going to be the remnant? Who's going to stay faithful? Come on, we're purposing here to be that remnant church. I believe that the Lord, like He said, is raising up an army. I've seen in a vision the army of the Lord. It's an army that is to carry His Word and His Spirit. It is an army that will be faithful to Him and His kingdom. Who will endure no matter what? Who will remain no matter what? He's looking for such. The Lord has always had a remnant. He's always reserved a remnant for Himself. I can't talk about all the other people in the body of Christ. I love the whole body and I hope the remnant is really, really, really big. But what I have to purpose is that I'm the remnant. What you have to purpose is that you're the remnant. What I have a responsibility for is this church being a remnant church. A remnant is a person that's going to love him and cooperate with him, follow him and obey him. A remnant is one that is going to honor his words by living it and proclaiming it. 
A remnant is one that is going to know the Holy Spirit by yielding to Him and carrying His presence. This is what it is to be a remnant. It's a true disciple, a disciplined one, faithful to the Lord, enduring to the end. I want to say this very carefully but very pointedly. It's time to move past just being a son of God. It's wonderful to be a son of God. I mean, instantly we're in and we're a son of God. Praise the Lord. I mean, instantly we're in and we have rights and privileges all based in the love of God and what Jesus did for us. But it's time that the church move from being a son of God and taking those, those rights and those privileges into being a servant of God. Amen. Whereby we are serving the Lord. Whereby we are following hard after Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The, the Lord is coming back. I want us to live in the reality of that. I used to say it a lot. I say it to myself. If the Lord was coming back, you knew at the end of this month, how would your life be different? What would you do differently? We need to live in the reality that Jesus is coming and I'm working and we're working to be an active member of the body of Christ. Come on, active in the army of the Lord. The truth is, I want my life to be God-made and not man-made. Don't you want that for you? Come on, I want my life to be Bible-centered, not self-centered. I want my life to be spirit-led, not self or flesh-led. I want my life to be of the kingdom of God and not of the world. Praise the Lord. The Lord needs those who are fully in, who won't hold back. He needs those who are going to cut every cord, burn every bridge that is behind them that ties them to the natural world. The Lord is looking for a remnant. He's looking for a remnant. Let me give you the definition of a remnant. It's a small remaining quantity. Now, you know, small can be relative. When you look at the, the millions of the world that have the opportunity, it means a surviving trace. It's something left over or a remainder. Often it's a small surviving group of people. Biblically, it means a small minority of people who remain faithful to God. You know, in the Old Testament, the concept of a remnant stood for the part of the nation that were going to stay faithful to the Lord even when most people rejected God or eventually they turned away from God. We are called the holy nation a nation of God's people. Did you know that in the Bible 540 times it refers to the remnant? God is serious about His church and He's serious about the remnant. Revelations 12, I'm not going to go into a bunch of that. I might do it later. But <clears throat> it gives a definition. It talks about that the devil is, is uh, basically enraged with the church and that the devil goes after to make war with the remnant, it says. And it defines the remnant as this, those that keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. I believe that we can say this, a remnant believer is a true disciple of Jesus Christ, one living and proclaiming the gospel, characterized by an obedience to the Word of God and a life fully yielded to the Spirit of God, and remains so until the end. Come on, are you going to remain? Come on, are you going to grit your teeth? Come on, are you going to get some fire in your belly? Come on, are you going to get some fire in your eyes and stay with the Lord no matter what? So a remnant church would be one that would be teaching and preaching the same and producing such disciples. I will say it again. I'm not interested in building a big church of a bunch of people. I'm interested in building a remnant for God. Amen. Those who love Him, those who are after Him, pursuing Him, loving Him, honoring and obeying His Word, living with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're after. That's what we're after at Houston Faith Church. So the truth is, we do need to evaluate, are we really who we think we are? Does our life really reflect who we think we are? Are we the remnant? Paul charges us many times in the Word that we are to examine ourselves, to see if we be in the faith, to see if we really be what we think we're being. You know, the heart can be very deceptive. That's why we have to live close to the Holy Spirit, because it's Him who brings 
things to light. It's Him who will help you identify the things that are tugging on you and pulling on you and trying to divert you. Jesus talks about two people who are saved as a remnant. When He speaks of the second coming, I want to look at both of them today because there's a lesson for us in this. And I want to show you how some of their attributes of these remnant people tied to the conditions that the Lord said were conducive to revival. I want to say this, if you can learn to live in revival, you won't turn away. Amen. 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 Because to be revived is to be in life with the Lord. Listen, and when you're really experiencing the life of God, there's nothing like it. Come on, there's nothing that can substitute for it. Come on, there's nothing else that can satisfy us. Praise the Lord. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. We're going to look at verse 37 through 39. This is Jesus speaking here. It says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Noah was the first primary example we see in the Bible of a remnant guy. The whole world in his day was given to wickedness. The thoughts of men's hearts were only evil continually. But the Bible says that God found Noah because he was consecrated. Because he was sold out to God. Genesis chapter 6, don't turn there. Verse 9, Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. And he walked with God. He had made a decision to walk with God. He was consecrated. Wasn't that one of the conditions of the Lord? That we have to consecrate when we consecrate to Him, when we set ourselves a life knowing that we are His. Listen, God wants to take full possession of you. God's not interested in just part of you. Listen, God gave everything for you. He gave all of His life. He gave all of His substance. He gave everything that there is for you. It's just right that we would give that back. He wants to fully possess us as His own. We are to consecrate to Him. The Bible says that Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. Why did he find grace? Because he wasn't a perfect man. He wasn't a sinless man, just like neither are we. But Noah found grace because he was consecrated to the Lord. And in Genesis chapter 6 verse 22, it says that Noah did according to all that God commanded him. Noah Noah was willing to obey God. He ended up being saved as a remnant. Uh, Chapter 7 verse 1 says, Because I have seen that you're righteous before me in this generation. Listen, there was a lot of wickedness in that day. There's a lot of wickedness today. But we're going to have to find a way, just like Noah did, in the midst of evil all around us, to live consecrated to the Lord, to live uprightly with the Lord. If Noah can do it, who didn't have what we had, he he didn't even have a covenant like we had. We who have the Word of God, we who have the Holy Spirit of God, we who have the blood of Jesus, if Noah can live righteously, we can live righteously. We can consecrate ourselves fully to the Lord. We can find grace. We can willingly walk with the Lord for this generation. Hallelujah. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7. It says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen, he moved with fear and prepared. Did you see that? By faith Noah, being warned of God of things as not yet seen, he moved with fear and prepared. I want you to notice some things about this remnant man. Number one, he was a faith guy. By faith, Noah. It's the very first thing that God identified about him as a remnant man, is that he was a faith man. Come on, if you're going to be a remnant, if you're going to be part of the remnant church, if you're going to live a remnant life, you're going to have to live by faith. You're going to have to know faith. You're going to have to exercise your faith. You're going to have to grow your faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Noah was able to believe for and prepare for the impossible, something that had never been seen before. Like that word the Lord said, like never before. Like never before. Come on, do I have any faith people in here that can take a hold of that word and say by faith like never before. I'm going to see things of God like never before. Hallelujah. The remnant lives by faith. 
Sometimes to others our faith looks foolish, but yet we remain. Amen. We don't move off of it. We don't let go. We don't let people sway us. People that don't know faith, they, they, will, oh, they will talk bad about faith as we know it. Let me say this about faith, just so that you remember. We do use our faith to beat the devil. Amen. We do use our faith to obtain the things. It's by faith and patience that we obtain the promises. God said that. We didn't say that. Amen. Come on, the faith preachers didn't say that. God said that. Amen. But I want to tell you, the number one thing about your faith is that it pleases God. Amen. The number one goal of faith is to please God. Amen. It's God that's calling you to the supernatural. Amen. It's God that calls you to the impossible. Amen. Praise the Lord. Number two, what do we see about this remnant man? is that he feared the Lord. I'm not talking about a scared fear of God where he cowered before God. I'm talking about a holy reverential fear of the Lord. Wasn't that one of the conditions conducive to revival? I believe that Noah lived in revival. Amen. He had a fear of the Lord. If you're, if you're a remnant believer, you're going to have to cultivate the fear of the Lord in your life. Listen, if you don't know much about the fear of the Lord, I have a series over there called the, the Fear of the Lord over a prophetic word that the Lord gave me about why the church misses out because of our casualness toward the Lord. It'll t it'll, those 300 scriptures about the fear of the Lord, most of them are in there. But we're going to have to get back, uh, back a very healthy, reverent, reverent, respect. Now listen, I know that God is everywhere. I know that God is with me all the time. God is in all places. I'm not talking about being reverent out of a, a, a something outward, but I'm talking about a reverence in our heart to honor God, to honor the house of God, to honor the kingdom of God, the people of God, reverently, respectfully, to honor. That's what the Lord wants a part of the fear of the Lord is to know the awesomeness of God. Amen. How, how many times sometimes in daily life we get so just looking around and so entrenched in, in life that we forget the awesomeness of God. God is able to do the impossible at all times in any situation. Amen. To know the fear of the Lord is to know how great our God is, that there's nothing that can stand against Him. That there's no name higher. There's no one greater. Amen. Another thing about this remnant man was because of his faith and because of his fear of the Lord, he obeyed. Amen. He moved. He did something. He did what was needed at whatever cost, at the cost of ridicule, at the cost of not even understanding himself. He honored God's words. Amen. Wasn't that one of the conditions conducive? He honored the word that God gave to him in, in telling him to prepare the ark. He honored that word by hearing it and by doing it. Isn't this what a disciple does? Amen. Isn't a disciple one that follows the Lord, walks with him, follows his instruction? Noah was a disciple. He was living in discipleship, not by his own ways, not doing according to his own will. Praise the Lord, he was a remnant believer. Number four, it says that his faith and the fear of the Lord caused him to give his time and his attention to the Lord. To put his time and his attention on the things of God. Do you know how much time it took to build that ark? Do you know that when many people were out doing other things, family gatherings, all kind of other stuff, Noah was building the ark. His time was given to the Lord. His attention was on the Lord. Come on, church. Amen. Isn't that one thing that the Lord said was a condition conducive is that we were kingdom-minded? Praise the Lord. Thinking about God's will, what God wants done, God's work. Listen, I'll, I'll say this. Because your life is going to follow your attention. Your hunger is going to follow your attention. If you want to be a remnant believer, you better get your attention primarily on the Lord. Seek ye first the kingdom and His righteousness and everything else will follow. Praise the Lord. Something else that we notice about him is that he built an ark. 
That ark was a place of safety. It was a place of shelter and refuge. He spent much time, gave much of his resources, devoted his life to building an ark. Come on, there is a place for us. The Bible later says that it was the ark of the covenant that housed the presence of God. You need to be building in your life the ark of the Lord in your own life. The place of refuge, the place of shelter, the place of safety, the place that you can run to and get into. Number six, we see that he prepared an ark to the saving of his family. I want you to know that the example of his life is what helped get his family into the safe place. That's a remnant. That's how we influence others around us, is that we live with the Lord right in front of them. Praise the Lord. So the Lord likens the days of His return unto the days of Noah, and He also likens them unto the days of Lot. Turn with me to Luke chapter 17. Praise the Lord. I hope, you fi- I hope you're finding yourself in the remnant believer. Amen. You know, Pastor Chaz has been preaching a lot on the fire of God. The fire is what burns out the stuff that distracts, the stuff that is not of the Lord. We need the fire of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pastor Chaz has been talking to us about checking up on ourselves. I believe this morning we're, we're checking into our life. Yes. We want to be one that remains. Come on, we don't want to be hot sometimes and then cold sometimes. Come on, we want to, we want to be on the track, Amen. the spiritual track of the Lord. I believe that God has a track for every believer. It's a good track. I mean, it, it's, it makes every high place low. It makes the low places high. Come on, it makes the crooked places straight. There, there's a track for you that God has prepared. And if you will get on that track and stay on that track. You know, if you get on a train... And you're, you're going through some, some stuff, some maybe some terrain that's a little bumpy and a little uh, not un- unsteady, it seems. And then you go through a tunnel. You know, and in the tunnel, it can get a little dark. It can get a little dim. It seems like you don't know where you're going. Listen, don't jump off the train in that place. That's right. That's right. Amen. Amen. That is sheer stupidity. And that's what I see happen to a lot of people. It's because of the situations of life. Because life gets tough. Because things don't work out right. Don't don't jump ship then. Don't jump off the track then. Stay with God. Stay with God to the end. He'll bring you out. He'll bring you through. Come on. He'll shed some light. He'll get you to the ending place of where you need to be. We got to stay with God. We got to be the remnant. Praise the Lord. Are we in Luke chapter 17? Verses 31 and 32. Again, this is Jesus speaking. It says, In that day he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Look at that statement. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. Praise the Lord. Do you know, out of all the people that lived in the cities of the plain, God only saved a remnant. When judgment came, He saved Lot. You know, there's a lot that you can read about Lot. It's It's not all great. I like that. God can always redeem your life. He can always redeem it. No matter what it is. No matter how bad, no matter how far. He can always redeem you. There's a lot we can read about Lot. There's a lot we can say about Lot. It's all in Genesis. But when I think about Lot... The thing I think most about what we can learn from him and how he survived, he was a survivor. Lot. 
He survived Sodom and Gomorrah. He came out. It was this, that he was willing to leave everything and not look back. That was hard, I'm sure. We read these things and we just think, oh, he left everything and didn't look back. To leave everything. Everything you know. Everything you love. Everything you've worked for. All your dreams, your desires. Your, fr your family, your friends, cities, places, people. What this tells me is that he did it by faith. We see again that Lot was a faith guy. First of all, he was consecrated to God. He had some issues. But when he counted, he stayed. He remained. It took courage to do what Lot did. Listen, if you're going to be a remnant believer, it's going to take some courage. Some strength of heart in these days. Guess where that comes from? It comes from the Lord. Amen. It comes from the Word of God. Amen. It comes from fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Amen. There is a strength within you. You just have to tap in. Amen. You just have to develop it. It was boldness that caused Lot to be able to leave everything. Isn't that a condition conducive to revival? Come on, if we're going to live in a revival, we're going to have to be bold people. Bold I and mean, just radical. I mean, just, just, just stepping out boldly, confidently, knowing that because God has said it, that God is there and He will uphold it. You know, Lot was able to do it. His wife wasn't. But that tells me is that there are going to be people around you that can't go there. Oh, but I want to take my family. I know you do. But you have to go yourself first. You have to be willing to go even if they don't go. Not everybody can go there with you. Not everybody's going to remain. We love them. We want them too. But according to Scripture, it's not going to happen. But we're going to have to set our eyes forward on the things of the Lord. On what God has for us. We're going to have to keep our eyes on the track that's in front of us. Amen. It was the fear of the Lord that caused Lot to do that, to get out of that sinful place. It was him loving God more than his people, more than his life. It was him loving God and what God loved. What does God love? He loves the church. What did Lot have to do? He had to hate the things that God hates. Are you hating the things that God hates? I mean, you're really hating them? Not people, but the sin and the weights that so easily ensnare us, entrap us, hold us, keep us from running the race. Lot's wife didn't become part of the remnant, but we're going to be the remnant. We're going to endure. We're going to have courage. Be strong in the Lord. We've got to be strong in the Lord. We've got to take courage every day. Step out in who He is. Lot survived as a remnant because he would and he could. First of all, there's two, there's two things to this. The first of all is willingness. I have a lot of people that will tell me, well, I can't. I've tried, but I can't. But you know, really, the being willing comes before the can't. And I find that really many times we hide behind the can't. We hide our unwillingness behind the can't. Because I know what the Lord says. The Lord says that when we make a decision of our heart, come on, when we step out in faith, real true faith, just like that testimony, when they made a decision that said, you know what, I'm not looking at these symptoms anymore. I'm just making a decision. I'm not looking. I'm going to be fully persuaded that what God has said. When that decision was there, the ability 
to manifest that truth met it. We can't hide our willingness, our unwillingness behind our can't. If you will really be willing, if you will really be willing, then you'll do whatever the Lord will have you do. Because if you're willing, the Lord will tell you. He'll give you instruction. He'll tell you how to prepare. He'll tell you what's necessary. He'll tell you what needs to go. He'll tell you what needs to change. And He'll give you the power to do it. God never says to do something that He doesn't give you the power to do it. It would be unjust. He can't do it. With it always, with the instruction, with the will of God, always comes the power to do it. It's time to be willing. It's time to be willing. Time to be willing. He would and he could let go. I I see that saying a lot, you know, let go and let God. Oh boy, if we could just master that. You know, many times we we have it so tightly in our grip that God just can't get a hold of it. But Lot was willing. And he didn't look back. And he didn't look back. We're going to have to move forward. You know, Paul said that. He said, no matter what, all the good things behind me, you know, no matter all the things I've seen and done, one thing I know, forgetting the things that are behind me. Listen, you can't live in even just the the good things of the Lord and the past testimonies of what God has done for you. Those things are are to be stepping stones for you, causing you to continue to look forward, to continue to believe far more than ever before. How about that? How about that? To believe far more than... Listen, these are God's words. These are God's words. Just like I said, when God's words come, there always comes a power with them to hook onto them and have them. I mean, I believe that in front of us is more than ever before. And I have to be honest, I've seen a lot. I mean, I've, praise the Lord, I've seen a lot of really good stuff, but, but more than ever before. That's what's in front of us. But we're going to have to be willing to not look back. You're going to have to be willing to look back on your disappointments, your pains, your hurts, your, your life, your successes, your failures. Come on, not look back at where, hey, back in the day. I don't care about back in the day. I care about today. Let's not, let's not live in the back in the day. Listen, I'm serious. We, we kind of joke around and we think that's back in the day. But listen, back in the day was back in the day. That was yesterday. I always say that today's anointing is way better than yesterday's anointing. Today's oil is a lot better than yesterday's oil. Come on, today's fire is a lot higher, a lot hotter than yesterday's fire. Come on, come on. The water today is a lot fresher than yesterday's water. I don't want to bathe in yesterday's water. I want to be in today's water. Right? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So my question is, what are you anchored to? What are you tied to? Are you tied to the world? Are you tied to your idea of success being based on what you can accumulate in the world? And I'm not talking about just money here. That's just a sign. I'm talking about there's all kinds of things you can accumulate in the world. Fame, success, people esteeming you, you know, whatever it might be. Or are you looking somewhere else? Or are you looking toward heaven? Come on, are you laying up treasure in heaven? Are you pursuing life with all you got? You know, the truth is that the devil wanted to destroy Lot. The devil's always been after God's people. He's after everybody, but he does. He hates God's people. He's always been out to destroy us. <clears throat> but I believe that the remnant have what it takes to defeat the devil. You know, I'm reminded of that scripture that says in James 4, verse 7, it says, Submit to God and then resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Because we all want to be able to resist the devil. I mean, I want to just be able to resist the devil. But it's first in submitting to God. What God's looking for is a consecrated life, a fully surrendered life. I'm talking about your whole life. I'm talking about uh, being a remnant people that will live 
holy unto the Lord, consecrated unto the Lord, not looking back, hating sin, walking in the fear of the Lord, repenting when needed. Amen. Listen, repentance is part of living the consecrated life. It's part of living with the Lord. Repentance, we all mess up. It's not about groveling. It's not about feeling shameful. But there is the Holy Spirit in us who will uh, kind of scratch us and all is, oh, Lord, I missed that. Sorry about that. Just, I mean, a heartfelt repentance. And then applying the grace that we have. Praise the Lord that we've got grace and we're covered. We're good. We're moving on. Amen. But I want you to know that repenting is based in a decision. Turning back to the Lord, letting go of things, looking forward is based in a decision. It's not based in a feeling, and that's where people miss it. You know, we, we come down, somebody pray me, I'm looking for a feeling. Listen, it's not about a feeling. It's about knowing the truth that God says, when you make a decision with your heart, Amen. that God will honor it. Sometimes you might get a feeling, but many times you don't. And you certainly can't be looking for a feeling. Repentance. A true turning to the Lord in the fear of the Lord is based on a decision of our heart. Praise the Lord. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. More information about Stevenson Ministries and Houston Faith Church is available online at HoustonFaith.tv. Chaz and Joni Stevenson are the pastors of a dynamic, growing church in Houston, Texas, and have a New Testament vision of preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit, helping people get saved, and building strong Christians who can impact their world. Houston Faith Church is a place where the love of God is real, where lives are changed, and where followers of Jesus become fishers of men.